This is the eLearn Podcast, episode number 82. It is paralysis by analysis. There is so much to know. I, you know, I'm still learning. Mm. I've been in it for almost three decades, and I am still learning different facets and different aspects of video. Just jump in. Mm. You know, just jump in, hit the, hit the record button, and see where it, it goes. You know, take those baby steps. Welcome to the eLearn Podcast. My name is Laddick, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. My guest for today is Josh Cavalier, a super experienced learning architect whose work has spanned almost 30 years and includes an incredible amount of accolades. Josh has always been at the forefront of educational video, and his current mission is to teach everyone the secrets of creating enduring instructional videos. Now, in this exciting conversation, Josh and I talk about why video may not be here to stay, at least in the sense we have of it today. Josh contends that the future of video demands we think about how we communicate with our learners differently. Josh and I then break down some of the myths of video making around things like production value and length. Next, we focus our conversation around video formats and why it's worth thinking about the touch points your content has with your students. Asking yourself, are they enough and are they the right ones? And finally, Josh and I dive deeper to discuss how touch points are laid out across a video to answer key questions. Josh explains that if you're making bulleted points in a more or less linear fashion, choose a short, crisp format. But if you really want to paint a complete picture, think of your video as a film in which the subject you're teaching plays a starring role. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The eLearning Podcast is sponsored by the eLearn Success Series, a uniquely valuable set of events that bring together sector experts and thought leaders to offer solutions to the most critical challenges and issues at the intersection of education and technology. Get your free ticket to all four sessions at eLearnSuccessSeries.com. And Open LMS a company that provides world-class LMS solutions that empower organizations to meet education and workplace learning needs. Learn more by visiting openlms.net. Hello, Josh. Welcome to the Elon Podcast. How are you today? Hey, fantastic. How's it going? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you're fantastic because so am I. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're recording this, you know, sort of, I want to still say it's the top of February. Is that, is that, it's February yeah. 8th, right? Uh, in 2022. Where do we find you sitting today? I am based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, in my home office where I've been for the past two years. I hope not locked, not locked in your own office. No, <laughs> no I got I got two dogs next to me. I got one downstairs. So they're my companions in this journey. Fantastic. Yeah. North Carolina. When's the last? I can't remember the night last time I was in North Carolina. As everybody knows, listening here, I'm down here down in Mexico City. Um, we are already looking at spring. I love it. It's we're coming out of the the cold snap. So it's pretty yeah. Cool. We got flowers coming up, which is really oh. odd. They were coming up in January. <laughs> I don't. Got I me. don't think that's right. I mean, yeah, my, no. something something does that. that's not right. <laughs> no, but we'll take it. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Josh, as I, I like to do. Um, I've already, you know, I've teed you up in the introduction and what we've talked mm -hmm. about and whatnot, but I love giving everybody the opportunity to give the 60 seconds about who you are and, and what you do. So why don't you take it away? Tell us about who you are. Sure. Uh, I've been in the L&D space for a little over 28 years. Uh, I got started as an art director way back in 1994, and I worked for an e-learning firm here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that was mostly around the financial industry, uh, immediately following uh, that uh, I started my own business, Lodestone, mm. and we were a digital media training company. We had five locations uh, in the U.S., uh, Houston, Cleveland, Boston, uh, here in Charlotte and Manhattan. Um, and so I did that for 20 years. Uh, and then two years ago, decided to go ahead and just put a pause on it and jump back into corporate. Mm -hmm. So I'm currently a learning architect at American Tire Distributors and I'm uh, my two year anniversary is actually this week oh, uh, and enjoying it thoroughly. Oh. And, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, during my prof you know professional career at Lodestone, I would go into a corporate environment and do consulting, mm -hmm. uh, which is great because I got to go into all kinds of uh, different companies, a lot of them and work with their L&D department and implement all kinds of different technologies, whether it be hardware, software, uh, video, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can't really see it through. Mm -hmm. And so now on my current journey, um, I can actually 
take hold of a project and just blow it out and actually see the business results from it. So um, it's really satisfying for me. My wife enjoys it because I put the pause on being an entrepreneur. <laughs> and so, you know, got her off that roller coaster. Um, and so uh, I'm in a good place right now. That's awesome. I, you know, yeah. I'm a, I am a fellow entrepreneur um, who joined Open LMS, you know, last August myself, you know, after what, 15, 17 year journey as well. So I totally get that. It's, yeah. it's, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a, it's a great feeling. It's, you know, there's, there's all kinds of wonderful emotions wrapped up in that, but you know, it's just all part of the journey. So. Yeah. And I would, I would tell your listeners that if you have an itch, go ahead and scratch it because you don't want to regret not doing it. So if you feel like making the jump, I can tell, tell them that there are so many different opportunities out there to be an independent business owner or even start your own small little thing. I think there's just so much activity out there in the L and D space um, that it really shouldn't, you know, if they have their chops down, it really shouldn't be a problem, uh, you know, firing something up. No, not, especially not, you know, over the last two years and, and as, yeah, we're, you know, yeah. as, as things are growing. So Josh, so yeah, you've been doing video for, I mean, I'll repeat it 28 years. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is like your, this is your wheelhouse. Right. What, you know, we're in 2022 now mm -hmm. uh, we've all, you know, have gone through sort of 24 months or maybe you know, 20 months of holy smokes, what's happening. And then, then resetting. And now people are coming up with actual strategies. Where does video sit? for higher education, for online training, for corporate training right now is, you know, is it, is it a must? Is it where we have to do this? Like what, what's your opinion? Yeah, I, I mean, it is a must, you know, if you are trying to figure out your learning ecosystem and your content creation process, you have to consider video. As a matter of fact, I think, you know, based upon what happened in the last two years, everybody was thrust into the position, even if they weren't considering it, they are now doing it. Mm. Uh, you know, whether it be synchronous or asynchronous uh, content. So I think, you know, based upon that, it's a maturation process. We're already, we're already in an environment where the sharing of video is nearly 80% of all the bandwidth that's shared on the internet. And also because of the hybrid office space, those associates are going to be, you know, accessing content on all kinds of different devices. And so, you know, video, you know, if you lean into video, I think it's a really elegant solution now, uh, just because of the, the ease at which to get into video. I know that when I first started, it was insanity. Mm -hmm. It was 160 by 120 postage size stamp video on a, you know, a 2X CD-ROM. Mm. <laughs> Lovely, right? <laughs> and, you know, now we're talking about resolutions that almost eclipse the printed page mm -hmm. uh, per frame of video. And so, and also um, hardware is, you know, anyone can get out a smartphone and cut a clip. And I think, you know, for a lot of individuals that are still hesitant, you know, if you think about the content that you watch on YouTube or, you know, all these various, you know, social video platforms, the quality is really not there. I think mm -hmm. as long as the audio quality is good, then whatever the content is, people, um, they give a lot of grace in regards to I was just going to say, quality. one of the things I've heard from our community is definitely, look, I'm, I'm an education professional or I am a training professional. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not an actor. I'm not a video producer, these kinds of things. How much yeah. should they obsess in your opinion over video quality, story arc, you know, these kinds of things. I heard you say audio is, is important, but where, where do you go there when you're counseling others about how yeah. much effort, I guess, to put into that side of things? It is paralysis by analysis. There is so much to know. I, you know, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I've been in it for almost three decades and I am still learning different facets and different aspects of video. Just jump in, mm. you know, just jump in, hit the, hit the record button and see where it, it goes, you know, take those baby steps, whether it's you're interviewing a subject matter expert or interviewing yourself or doing a screen recording or even using a tool online to build a simple animation. You know, this form of communication, you know, if we go back to, you know, if we look at the last 50 years and how we've progressed from the written word to radio, to television, to where everybody has access to create this 
you know, in this medium, this is like the new English. And what I mean by that is like the written word. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, my son who's 15 and his generation, they are building skills to actually communicate in this platform that will then carry over into the workforce. And mm -hmm. so, you know, are we taking advantage of that? Um, you know, there there is a certain level of skill as a communicator that, you know, people will lean into the written word. And, you know, that's a great foundation. And then there's the spoken word and there's pacing and there's the tone of your voice, all of that. And then there's the visual. Mm. And so, again, during this maturation process, I mean, I would challenge your viewers to actually, you know, stretch themselves and, and build some competency in, you know, creating video based content. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm pleased that you mentioned your son. I've, I've mentioned my son a few times on this podcast. Um, I've got three children, but my eldest, he's, you know, he's just looking at high school now. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm really fascinated. Just, it's just, I don't want to say they're, they're not digital natives. We know that that's not a real thing. Um, but at the same yeah. time, the ecosystem that they play in, is the better yes. way to think it is just so different than what you and I experienced. Right. And, and so I think you know, people right. who are in management level right now, people who are leaders, they have to kind of, in my opinion, take themselves out of that nostalgia for the past and just say, Hey, look, you know, it, it is going to be video first. There is not going to be a whole lot of um, reticence of just, you know, sort of here's the, here's the three minute message or whatever. And that's going to be extemporaneous. And we're going to do it again next week and next week. Would you agree? Totally. There's a complete transformation as far as the digital experience within corporations in higher ed. And, and again, the last two years, there's a massive maturation process that occurred. And for those of us in this space uh, that are, that's creating content, um, you don't want to be left behind. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, everybody has an, an area of expertise and that information needs to get out there to help people. And if you, are um you know hesitant just because you don't or lack video skills just click the re record button that's mm. the only way that you're going to learn and um I, I don't want those individuals to be left behind i want them to i want them to be included in what's currently happening in the lnd space and um you know but i, I think for a majority of educators um, again, whether it's in higher education or even, even you know, K through 12, higher ed and corporate, I have a feeling that most of them have already dabbled uh, mm. or have been put in a position where they were forced to actually go ahead and make the leap. Um, but, the, you know, there, I get a lot of feedback from individuals that they um, it didn't feel right or mm. they failed and they got it. They got to push through those failures because there is going to be a single clip that they produce that is of high value and they're going to get feedback from that. And it's at that moment that things change, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you have directly impacted somebody's life from this content that you produced. Even if it was a bad quality, there was some intrinsic value to it, right? Because it would, because it just happened. Sure. So get out there and just, you know, just go for it. Well, you know, and I, I, does this analogy work for you as well? I've been astounded sometimes when you think about like, you know, you think about the community you live there in, in Charlotte, in yeah. North Carolina or down here, you know, like it's like that community neighborhood website or the forum that you have for your school or something like that, which, you know, it feels like it's old school, it's crap, but everybody uses it because yeah. it provides what you need. It's the system that everybody's used to, those kinds of things. So I think that there's definitely a huge case to be made for high quality, super produced, you know, wonderful things. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why masterclass is, is killing it. And that's why, you know, we love, oh, you know, right. great. Yeah. That, and that's all what, like why we love high quality, you know, YouTube producers, but there still is that place. Like I, I love that you're counseling that um, just go for it and look for, you know, putting the value out that you can put out right as as an instructor as a teacher and worry less about the quality and let that improve itself over time as you get better and better at it yeah you know and I, and I you know have peers who are content creators um you know that are out there and they're putting video based content and they just started they just started even being in the space you know they they may not have been adept in doing a youtube quality type video but you know what over time just because of the reps they got good at it you mm. know whether it be like 
adjusting the lighting, putting in the background, getting a new microphone, whatever the case may be. But, you know, they were proactive, they analyzed their content and they, and they just got better. And well, so I think that's what you're saying right there too, is, is just make a commitment to having this to be a part of your, your, you know, it's, it's, and it's like any sort of exercise or growing any kind of muscle. You've just got to, yeah. every time you do that next rep, Hey, what, you know, what can I adjust? What can I do a little differently or whatnot to make it a little yeah. better? And, you know, and the other thing too, is that some people are apprehensive of just being on camera. You don't have to be on camera. You mm -hmm. do not have to be on camera. You know, think about Khan Academy. That, that Khan went ahead and created a whole, you know, new platform for education, um, you know, the flipped classroom type concept. And he was never on camera. He mm -hmm. was just there illustrating his concepts. That's powerful, you know, and so if you have an animated PowerPoint deck and you do and you're talking over it and that information again is going to impact somebody, that's valuable. Mm -hmm. So again, don't don't feel like you need to be on the camera to get started and then maybe just kind of, you know, do a quick intro or whatever. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, you know, do something small and then kind of work up from there. Cool. So we've been talking about, uh, you know, just sort of getting in the game and yeah. using video. When I'm thinking about creating video, when I think about, you know, I don't know, you spend most of your time in the corporate world. What's, you know, what is the, you know, the, the right length for a training or a session or, a, you know, a, a kernel of knowledge? There's been a ton of talk about yeah. micro, micro learning. This is like, you know, been the flavor of kind of the last six months or so. Um, where do you, where do you stand on, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to train something, something what, like what's the recommended length of the video? Yeah, the video needs to be as long as it needs to be. <laughs> so, um, yes. what I, so yeah, that was, you know, loaded kind of answer. So what I mean by that is that, you know, as, as practitioners of transferring knowledge, we need to be proficient in handling cognitive load. Mm -hmm. and, and so that information actually flows into a user's brain so that they can actually process it and file it for, you know, for, you know, uh, long-term memory. So, you know, there, there's all kinds of different aspects. If we look at the learning journey, right, it, it begins with motivation and instructional marketing, and mm -hmm. then you have, you know, pre-learning uh, information that is out there uh, prior to taking an e-learning course or uh, taking an online course, whatever, there's some pre-work type videos. Then there's actual e-learning or class or whatever content itself. Then there's post, right? So post mm -hmm. class boost, um, you have performance support. Then we have, um, if peers want to go ahead and record their own video to support the learning journey itself, we also have that, you know, and so if you, if you look at the breadth of the learning journey, what I just mentioned there, there are different types of videos that are created for those touch points in the learning journey. And they would have various lengths depending upon where and how they were consumed. Now, I just you know gave a presentation about macro video right mm -hmm. uh back in october um and you can strategically create a long form video that works you know and some people are like well you shouldn't really you know create a video over one minute two minutes three minutes eight minutes whatever the case may be now you know based upon the industry it's true that after around six minutes we start to get a drop off mm -hmm. of uh, individuals paying attention. Now we don't know what the quality of those videos are. Right. Uh, well, you know, based upon some platforms, we we do have kind of an idea. You know, like LinkedIn Learning or Lynda.com, formerly Lynda.com, they have a certain quality level. And you know, but after six minutes, those viewer the viewers start dropping off as mm -hmm. far as audience retention. But if a video is orchestrated properly and you give moments where the user can unload out of temporary memory, the information, like for instance, if I were to like do a long form video and about three minutes in, I'm like, okay, go ahead and uh, hit the pause button on your player. And I'd like you to go ahead and take some notes about what we just learned. Sure. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So now boom, that's unpacked and then crank the video back up again. And then now we move on to the next learning objective. Right. So I've, I've, in, I've put into the orchestration of the video, a way to unpack or park that information or get it out of, um, you know, temporary memory, mm -hmm. right? So, but you have to be strategic about that. I and mean, there's a lot of planning that goes involved if you're, if you're doing a long form video, but you know, for, for individuals that are motivated to learn 
uh, deep topics, right? It, especially things that they're emotionally attached to, or it means their job, like, hey, I'm an electrician, I gotta learn about this safety or get my license. I'm like here for the long haul mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's my livelihood. So they're gonna be paying attention. So if we orchestrate or put together a video that that does that strategically, I'm completely fine with a 20 minute educational film. Mm -hmm. Completely fine with it. But if it's just learning objective, learning objective, learning objective, compounded and piled on top of each other without stoppage or without ways to um you know offload the information it's it's a disservice mm. uh if if the individual is going to go ahead and watch it all the way through now keep in mind that because we now have the ability to control the way that we view a video well they can pause it any time that they want they can go ahead and watch a portion of it they can go ahead and search within a long form video so that leads me to the player or the environment that you store your video. So you know, before was, before you go mm -hmm. there, I, I definitely want to get on the player. But all I've been thinking of when, in as you're talking about mm -hmm. long form is I'm going to totally forget his name. Um, is it Ken? Ken Hurt? Who did the the Vietnam documentary? And well, Ken Burns. Ken Burns. That's his name. Right. Yeah. I mean, you think about okay, this is an educational piece, but each one of those, you know, this, that was like 18 hours of learning about that. You know, um, does is it again and i'm 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 thinking about the people uh -huh. listening right now there's a great story arc there you know and there's a reason yes. like you know there's a reason why somebody may choose to listen to a four hour podcast like hardcore history or something like that right um but when we're talking about a corporate training or a compliance training or even you know something that's critical for your job skills like you know some some upskilling for you know a new product or something does it matter about how obsessed I am with the, with the topic and, you know, those kinds of things? I think so. I mean, you know, there, there has to be some depth there uh, to main, maintain the viewer's attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I look at like a, a TV show like Good Eats, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know, we're going way back in the archives now as far <laughs> as TV. But the way that that show was set up, it was a, it was a learning I mean, it was a cooking show, but I mean, you were learning about the science of cooking and the way that the offload of information was done was phenomenal. It was just so well done in regards to the visualizations, the props, the comedy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was it was just a, a great orchestration of all that information. And, you know, I, I think there is some things that we can learn from TV, like you mentioned, Ken Burns, that we can use in L&D. Okay. And when we're when we're putting together multiple learning objectives in a long form video, it's great to bring back a subject matter expert on the screen to create a natural transition into the next learning objective. You know, it's that natural um, pause or summary mm -hmm. um, at the end of a concept that you that then you know allows the individual to. Um, put it into hopefully long-term memory, or at least take a note or do something to get it out of temporary storage and then move on to the next learning objective. You know, it's just not like plowing through the whole, the whole experience or all the, the knowledge. Mm, excellent. So you were talking about the player. So I, I before I interrupt, oh, yeah. going, going from sort of the video itself to the fact that we have this, this player. Yeah. I, I, I believe that, for those of you that are attempting to put video in your learning ecosystem, I can't emphasize enough to have a platform and or a player that allows the individual to have control and or um, like with closed closed captioning, like accessibility, right? That's that's critical. Or I'm in an environment, I can't hear the audio, but I can see that read the closed captions, things like that. Findability is probably one of the biggest problems that um, learning, you know, whether it be higher ed or corporate, uh, these environments have. Like individuals need to find information from a performance support standpoint, and they have a hard time finding it. Um, also, you, <laughs> we, we've gotten into this uh, habit over the last two years of just hitting the record button. And on every meeting or whatever, people are recording, oh, so-and-so can't make it. Can you go ahead and hit the record button? But really, how many of us actually go back and watch that? I mean, I do right, watch right. some. If I know it's an important meeting or something, I'm going to go and watch that. But findability is, is critical. 
because mm -hmm. people don't want to waste time. So mm -hmm. if you have um, um, a video content management system that allows findability of those videos, it's massively powerful. So as we ingest video into a video content management system, if it tags it with metadata, if it allows searchability of certain words or all words in the video, it saves a huge amount of time because I can look at an hour long meeting. I mean, there are even some video platforms that are out there that will analyze words being written on a whiteboard and use mm -hmm. object character recognition mm -hmm. and tag that moment in time. Wow. <laughs> so I can go ahead and do a search and then it'll take me to that moment in time that that word was written on the whiteboard. That's How powerful fantastic. is that? It's insane. Are there well, are these technologies that I'm going to have to get you know approved from my school or from my from mm. my company or whatever? Like, are there open source stuff or or free versions of this available that you'd recommend? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, the, everything that I've mentioned, well, well, not everything. I mean, some of the things I've mentioned so far are definitely commercial implementations of a video content management system. There are open source solutions that are out there for. Um, you know, schools and or companies that really don't have that budget. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, but even, you know, if we do a private YouTube channel, that's amazing. I mean, you can actually go ahead and put content out there on YouTube as a private video and leverage all of, you know, the playback capabilities that that, that platform allows and, and findability. Cool. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about, you know, designing the video experience and you know what kind of player have like what how do you then put this in the in you know in the on the table for learners i mean how are we delivering this is this you know mm. like i said very extemporaneous where it's like hey class you know i've got this video today or is this something that's really yeah. structured over time or like what like what's your recommendation there well you know to me it's all about ease of access right again it's 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 making sure that somebody can uh, not burn time, either finding the information that they need or watching a video that's part of a you know, flipped classroom experience or whatever the case may be. And so, you know, if we think about some of the experiences that we had, um, you know, with e-learning and trying to find a video that's parked inside of an e-learning course, very mm -hmm. difficult, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, whether you're parking a video inside of a PowerPoint, an e-learning course, uh, even inside of a PDF or um, in a video content management system, whatever the case may be, you know, again, what's the ease of access for your students? If there are barriers to getting to that content, the motivation is going to drop mm -hmm. exponentially. And, and over time, they just won't even search out or find that video. They'll look for a different source. You know, this again, is from, <laughs> I remember when, uh, you know, companies first got online as far as the internet, how they would balk at whatever their corporate learning content was, especially for like desktop software, and they immediately went to YouTube. You know, mm -hmm. people were upset because I can't access YouTube at work. And so they would right. wait until they go home at night and then watch <laughs> YouTube, right? right? And it's like, well, think about it. It's, it's accessibility. I would need to go and find this information in a short period of time, and I don't want these barriers that are there. So as you try to implement video, again, whether it's part of an online presentation, whatever the case may be, what is that user going to experience? What are they going through um, it, to access that content? And we want to remove all the friction. Mm. I, 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 it, that resonates with me so deeply. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. If, another way to say that is just, well, you I, again, I go back to my 13-year-old. Yeah. The, you know, the, the literal definition of impatience, right? Where it's like, if, you know, if, if we can't come up with the answer or there isn't just an immediate solution, he's already moved on. He's already either found a, a workaround or a way around it. And so, you know, it, it, even as adult learners, we're, if we're thinking about the, you know, the higher ed space, but also just sort of the, the workers that are in the workforce right now, uh, that frictionless, uh, you know, path to your the yes. content that you want is, that I would obsess over that. That sounds like something I would I worth worth obsessing over. Yeah, I'm the lead tech in my household, and <laughs> when there is speak to the crowd, yeah, yeah. When there is friction, I know about it. <laughs> this connection sucks. I can't. I can't. My computer is not booting up. I got to get on a Zoom call and blah blah blah. I can't. Yeah. What's going on with the internet? It's just you know. And so, if we if we remove all of those negative situ you know, those experiences that our students are going through, 
and, and, and put content out there that, again, is easy to consume, easy to find, there's no friction, then, I mean, you have, you have a really good chance of, of um, you know, accelerating your, your video strategy. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you put content out there, and again, for many of us, for years, we parked content in, uh, um, you know, in an environment that was very difficult for users to find. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, consider that. Consider d- the different options or maybe putting a segment of a long training course uh, in, in an area where um, users can access it easily. You know, one of the other things that a lot of folks don't take advantage of is analytics. And mm-hmm. when you park a video that's um, like a progressively downloaded video in an e-learning course, you get no analytics from it other than, hey, we know that they've opened up the video or right. opened up the course. But if I were to go ahead and put the video on a video content management system, I get all these rich analytics. Mm. And let's say long form video, got a 20 minute video. I can actually look at my audience retention over time. And if they scrubbed and and it pops up and then they drop back off or whatever the case may be, I can look at it and go, hey, majority of my audience went back at minute four and watch this segment for a minute and 28 seconds. Let me go ahead and segment that out as a performance support video. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. But again, if I don't have a video content management system, I can't I can't do that. What about, um, we've mentioned a couple of times here, okay, so frictionless, and then also, you know, people want to find the content and yeah. they don't want to waste time and those kinds of things. Let me flip that notion on its head. Okay. What, what about designing in time for the workday or designing in time for people to build skill and those kinds of things? So much of what we talk about is learning in the flow of work, you know, kind yes. of the, here, where, how do I get my immediate answer? Juxtapose that for me for a second with, I, you know, I'm really, I want to invest in my, either my students or my, my staff I, and I want them to build skills. So I'm going to carve out time for them to actually go do this. Is there a difference in that or is, are they, do they still have the same needs and wants from video and it's not sort of, Hey, let's sit back and get some popcorn kind of thing. It's a great question. I think in higher ed, it's way different than corporate, mm-hmm. you know, in high in higher ed, the, notion that you're going to be spending long periods of time gaining knowledge uh, that's what acquiring you're skills <laughs> that's what that's all it, it's it, it's a given mm-hmm. in corporate especially in the onboarding process there is a juxtaposition between hey by the way the onboarding process is going to take 90 days and we need you to be productive day one <laughs> yeah sure wait what yeah uh so i think uh you know in in, in talking to leaders of organizations about setting precedent for their managers, being able to go ahead and communicate that there is no negative recourse for spending four hours a day for the first three weeks in the LMS or in whatever learning environment, video content management system, whatever the case may be, to learn about our company, to learn about our policies and procedures and HR and all that, setting that precedent. I I think there is, you know, employees get confused because Mm -hmm. they will jump in an environment and they feel compelled to be productive right away. And they're like, Oh, I got to take this, you know, this training. And it's like, click, 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 done. Okay. I'm done with my onboarding, but they've missed, you know, so much information because what would have taken three weeks, I got through it in the first five days. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, giving that grace to an employee that you can take four hours, at, well, I'm just throwing a number out there. You can take the allotted number of time and just please use it for learning, learning about our company and learning about our vision or strategy or purpose, whatever the case may be. And, and, and setting that precedent, you know, so, so now you're, now we're talking about culture change because <laughs> That's got to be weaved within the culture and all managers of any organization need to be banging that drum the same way. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like sort of how much has L&D today, you know, 20 months into the pandemic started to wag the tail, you know, the tail wagging the dog of, you know, what what we're learning is, hey, if you want to retain your team, we've got to give them space. We've got to give them the ability to grow and and those kinds of things. It's sort of more of a thought experiment there rather than anything else. Well, I think it's a man, uh, it's a matter of going back to the business and understanding what their pain points are mm-hmm. about the onboarding process because it's it's there's a there's a give and take. 
we need these people to be productive because of X, Y, and Z. If they're not doing these specific tasks right out of the gate, then we have these types of problems. Well, okay, so now we can go ahead and we can, we can structure this a little bit differently. So on day one, we're, let's front load it. Let's go ahead and have them do like you know, five hours or six hours, which may be kind of intense. But then on day two, they're gonna go ahead and shadow somebody in sales or mm -hmm. whatever, or be on the floor of the warehouse or whatever the case may be. So I think there's a dance. You can't like um, to just go ahead and flat out say, hey, it's four hours every day. I mean, that's that's good that you're starting there. But realistically, there is an expectation of where leaders need to have that employee productive at a certain point in time doing certain tasks. And I think the role of uh, you know, L&D is to actually go ahead and interview you know, these you know, these different roles. Uh, leaders in different roles and figure out, you know, what are those pain points and how, how can we work together to onboard our employees so that it's like, again, I mentioned fr frictionless, right, to where, because we know based upon science that, you know, if an employee feels, or if you're just stressed out, you're not learning, mm, you know, that's, that's for sure. From a cognitive load standpoint, you just, you, you can't take in information because you're, you're thinking about so many other things. So we go ahead and we create space where somebody can go ahead and learn and take in that information, but then they know ahead of time, they're going to have to go ahead and switch gears and then jump into that role, like learning whether, you know, be shadowing or whatever the case may be. So I think there's a lot of work that L&D needs to do around that area of, um, and it's just not with onboarding. I, I think it's, you know, setting the cadence, the daily cadence of learning within an organization, um, you know, whether it be a system rollout or, uh, you know, a change in HR, you know, things that are dramatic changes within an organization, that can also be the case. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, <laughs> I've been involved with system rollouts, where you you may have orchestrated the best L&D effort for the system rollout. But again, based upon the role, someone may not take the training or because of, you know, pressure or sales or whatever the case may be. And, you know, management's like, hey, why are we getting all these calls into the, you know, IT help center mm -hmm. on this system? Like, in the training looks great. We don't understand what's going on. Well, we didn't give them the space. We didn't give them the time or, you know, uh, the ability to actually go ahead and, and do it properly, take the training. So that takes my brain to sort of the obsession of the future, right? So like looking down the path here, we have web 3.0, yeah. we've got, you know, the metaverse coming in. That, that's yes. I, I swear that's like popping up in my newsfeed like every day now for some reason. Um, you know, Peter Thiel just met, just left the metaverse, you know, universe today he, by walking yep. the board of Facebook. Where yeah. is that? Like, are, is that where we're headed? Like, it, how is video going to play out in this? Are we going to be starting? It, mm. do we all need to have the expectation that virtual reality and augmented reality is in our future. Or what do you what do you think about these new worlds? It is going to be a long maturation process. I, I don't. Uh, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm 51. And mm. so I've seen the Internet from its infancy to today. And along that way, there has been other efforts to have 3D worlds or environments if we think like Second Life. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I tell the story all the time. I was teaching a class and, uh, you know, about Internet technology, and I was doing a demonstration of Second Life. And this woman in the back of the room raises her hand. And she goes, why would I even want to use Second Life if I don't have a first life? <laughs> right. And at, at that moment, I was like a good point let's go ahead and move on <laughs> so uh you know and again it's it's there's a lot of truth in that statement and you know i will there be situations or times where the metaverse would be advantageous to consume video in mass or yeah but i i think there's there's a lot of room for exploration i don't me personally like i'm not going to go all in on the metaverse and video i think there's a lot more to be done as far as like, you know, like cons consumption of video on this device. Like I just got a monitor installed that's in a portrait orientation so I can record oh, video right, right. Yeah, that looks your, like I just picture. got that. Mm -hmm. You know, why should I, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and mess around and, and work on, you know, training videos that are in portrait orientation. 
and explore that area. I, I can't even, yeah, we can go ahead and put video in VR and there's a lot of room for that. And I, I'm not going to like poo poo the idea, but I think there just, there, there needs to be, um, it, it's gotta be practical. Mm. Again, it's gotta be frictionless. I'll bring that word up again. Yeah. Friction, there's a lot of friction with it, with that experience. I think it's going to take some time for it to get to the point where it's not frictionless. Awesome. Yeah. Um, one, one last thought before, uh, we kind of bring this to a close, like, uh, in that same vein, uh, you know, when we talk about frictionless, when we talk about sort of user expectation, mm -hmm. when we talk about, you know, what, ex finding the knowledge you need right now, where do you stand on Instagram reels, TikTok? you know, sort of these bite-sized video clips mm -hmm. transforming the way that we expect to receive video and how we create it and those kinds of things. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that any medium to where we have exponential content creation happening is like this massive experiment of I have 60 seconds. I'm in a portrait orientation. What works? Mm -hmm. There are things out there that work. I mean, people will go ahead and watch a reel or watch a TikTok video and learn something. But I, the difficult part is is it a video that is motivating me to do something which is emotional versus i just watched a video and i actually learned something that i can apply as a skill or knowledge where i could go ahead and add on to that knowledge or whatever the case may be and i, and I think there's a lot of confusion out there because if we watch like a cooking video you may be inspired to go cook the dish but the video itself didn't include all the information that you need to be successful Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a lot of reels and there's a lot of TikToks that are out there that will go ahead and show a technique or something skill based. And it's almost there. And it's almost like motivating you to learn more to execute properly. But not all the information is there. Like, you know, there's not many re uh, reels or TikToks where it's like, hey, in addition to this video, download the PDF <laughs> with all of the right. right? Like it yeah. should like here's, here's the, the recipe. Manual. And yeah. Right. Not, not some people are doing that, but not everybody. So I, I'm all for it. I mean, anytime that there is a shift or a change in the way that we consume media, I lean in because I want to know everything about the way that that happens. And if it's like something as simple as using the rule of thirds, but in a portrait orientation, and how does that segment the screen and where does the user eye go? And you know, how am I going to go ahead and take advantage of that if I'm going to go ahead and put a reel out there that has educational content? So, uh, um, yes, I am extremely positive when it comes to those different platforms and experimenting and, you know, seeing. I mean, I specifically sign up to TikTok just so I could see educational video. Now, I don't get educational videos all the time, <laughs> but it's still fascinating to see really good educational content that's out there that. People have, have used that medium, have used that platform, and they're doing it successfully. I think there's a whole, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely psyched that we're kind of winding things down on this topic because I feel like this is a whole nother conversation about the difference between motivational video and yeah. emotional video versus instructional video, right? That's versus correct. That's gonna, and that you've, uh, I, you're the first person to, on the podcast, really like my mind has really wrapped its head around that. And I can, I like, I feel that distinction, right? Like watching correct. a TikTok or watching a reel where you're like, wow, that was cool. That guy jumping off the pier or, you know, the, watching the snowboarder or, you know, the dancer or whatever. And then wait, but how do I actually then go do something or accomplish that myself? Different universes entirely. Correct. But I wonder, but I wonder, is there, are we, and obviously this is not new, but do we just discover like, maybe we have those motivational ones and then use that as the, as the, the jump off point to get to the instructional point. I'm really surprised to hear you say, you don't see very many, very many creators saying, Hey, I've motivated you now. You know, here's the course in the background, come by it, you know, that kind of thing. Well, the, for the ones that get it, they are combining both the motivational with the actual instruction right mm -hmm. and that is the key the key is you know like gagne he mm -hmm. one of the first you know tenets of that is gain attention right mm -hmm. when we're doing learning so 
you know, that's for folks that can gain attention in the first five seconds, you got someone's attention, they're fully engaged, they're taking in all the auditory and visual information, and then you hit them with the knowledge transfer, you know, content, then maybe you buffer it with another emotional, um, you know, segment of maybe the subject matter expert coming on the screen, boom, go to learning objective number two, and then you finish off at the end with emotional content, you know, so there, there is an orchestration that can occur that is optimal for learning, both raising emotion and senses and then ratcheting it back so that we can go ahead and transfer knowledge properly. Mm, awesome. Last question mm -hmm. I have for you, okay, uh, Josh, is when I ask everybody on the show, and that is what are you excited about in this e-learning universe over the next, let's, you know, it's the near term future, six months, 12 months, 18 months. Is there a shiny new object? Is there a process? Is there a company? Is there a thing that you're like, you just maybe want to tell everybody or, or just something that you're psyched for yourself and your career. Uh, just getting back with people, ah. you know? And so I, I've, you know, I go out and I speak and I have been to conferences with people, but it's, it's not exactly the same. And I have a feeling that as we go into conference season into the fall, it's going to possibly be back to where it was before just the energy, the knowledge sharing. I can't, you can't just, those events are amazing. Mm. And I, I look for the day when we can actually, you know, go and, and be with our peers and be in environments where those, you know, those high frequency type events type occur. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to in 2022 to getting back out there and uh, hopefully with some sense of normalcy and sharing ideas. Fantastic. Josh Cavalier, thank you so much for being on the eLearn podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode of the eLearning Podcast. If you like what you heard, please do me the favor of following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or whichever social media you prefer. Also, if you're interested in diving deeper on eLearning, I encourage you to get your free ticket to the eLearning Success Summit, where there are more than 70 hours of presentations on best practices. Just go to eLearningSuccessSummit.com. And then finally, for the latest news, information, and resources about eLearning, come subscribe to our newsletter at lmspulse.com. Thanks.